My name is Dennis. I'm here with my colleagues Jack and Chris, and also our designer Justin is here somewhere. Wave, Justin, if you're around. Woo! Okay. Um, we are the Ableton Learning Team, and what we do is build interactive musical learning environments that run in web browsers. So we're going to do a kind of tag team presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've released so far and why, sort of the motivation behind it. Then I'm going to hand it off to Jack, who's going to talk about how this works on the web and why the web is an interesting place for this kind of work. And then finally, off to Chris, who's going to show you something kind of interesting. It's a sneak peek of the next thing that we're going to release, which is not ready yet. You are the first people outside of Ableton to see it. So uh, I hope that it lives up to, to how exciting I made that sound. He's also going to talk a little bit about how Max has played a role in the work that we're doing. So uh, we start. our work starts from a certain premise, which is that music making is hard. We just assume that it is hard. Ableton and Cycling and companies like this make products that are necessarily complex. They're aimed at professionals who have needs that we can't anticipate ahead of time, and so the software has to be able to do a lot of things. Um, people try to learn these environments. They spend a lot of time and energy trying to learn how these tools work. My original job at Ableton was writing the manual for live. I got that job because I kind of knew how live worked. And I pretty quickly figured out, well, I figured out a couple things. One was that that was not really a full-time job because we don't make that many things. Um, but the other one was that people at all levels of understanding of the software still have fundamental problems with, musical, with making music. So that the technology is not the only potential hurdle. There's the cost. There's musical complexity. There's inherent fear. There's people's bad experiences with a lousy education, for example. There's lots of ways that somebody might stop making music. There's lots of ways that somebody might be stopped before they even start. And I, I quickly realized that just teaching people how to use live was only solving part of the problem. So here's a typical scary slide that shows all the kinds of different complexities that you might imagine. Musical complexity and complexity in live and in Max and in an overly expensive hardware studio. Um, all of these and many more are reasons that somebody might be intimidated and stop. Uh, if you look, at, and so this is like the end state, right? This is where you could imagine someone thinks, ah, this is what it will mean when I know how to use these tools and can make music with them. And this is what things look like at the beginning, right? So everybody knows this blank slate experience. I'm not really sure that this is any less intimidating. Um, because for, if you don't know the system, you look at this and you say, what now? If you do know the system, you just see the potential work ahead. So for all of us in this room who know how these environments work, you see uh, it's time to, to get down to business. So all of this is really intimidating. So all of these tools offer the possibility to do anything. So by default, they look like nothing. They're blank canvases. Our approach on the learning team is to try to find something in the middle. We, we can't make these systems simpler. So we want to make new systems that show something rather than everything or nothing. And by doing this in the browser, we immediately eliminate one potential hurdle, which is cost. So the tools that we make run on any device that can run a modern web browser. And uh, the thing that we've made so far is this. This is a free website that attempts to teach music learning fundamentals. Yeah, take down the URL if you haven't been to this site before. We'd love you to check it out sometime as well. It's an intro to fundamental musical concepts like sound, like harmony, melody, rhythm, form. Um, I'm going to switch now to actually showing the site. So the goal here is not to start at the beginning. It's to start in a kind of conceptual middle and then work outwards, letting people play with existing material, then deconstruct it, and then make new material using this frame. And if you're familiar with live session view, this will look pretty familiar. You have a column of musical events that start and stop on downbeats and are play exclusively. And then you can also play across the rows to create different combinations of these patterns. And things start and stop all synchronously. So we've made essentially a tiny little session view pre-populated with musical ideas. Um, more than even teaching, our goal is to give people immediate musically satisfying experiences. We want to catalyze people's confidence. And we found that even by giving people 16 loops they didn't make, letting them play with them in various combinations is really compelling for people. Because if you gave people this in live, 
what buttons would you push? There's a hundred more buttons in the session view. And in, in this world, the only thing you can do is this. So on the next page, we break this apart a little bit and we introduce a, a very simple four step, four track step sequencer for drums. So I can create and edit notes. It's pretty, uh, pretty fast. If you know Live or any other DAW, think about how hard it is for a new person to get to this moment. You need to understand that the thing doesn't make sound by itself. You need to understand that there's a browser and you get sounds from the browser. They have to be loaded to a certain type of track. That track has to be armed. You have to either have a controller attached and then you're in MIDI land. And how does all of this work? Just getting to this is actually remarkably uh, intimidating. So we wanted to take that away to try to take the intimidation away. What you lose, of course, is the ability to make those kinds of choices. But what you gain back is the ability to make sound fast. So we, we get to something like pitch. And here we've made a choice, which is to introduce pitch as a continuum before we introduce the notion of quantized pitch. So we give you a little space where you can play around with a theremin-like slider. And then immediately below it, we build a way to quantize that into pitches. So we're trying to make things simple, but we also want to teach very fundamental musical principles rather than, when possible, super style-specific practices. Pitch as a continuum isn't weird to anyone in this room, and it's not weird unless you think about the notion of like a C diatonic scale as being foundational. And it's not really foundational, it's just common. So by making continuum be the way that we base our way of thinking about pitch, we also get to do things that are actually really hard to do in live, like there's a 19-tone equal tempered scale later, some Indonesian tunings. These are things that shouldn't actually be complicated, but they're not often taught at this level because they're not common. And we're trying to find a way of bridging this world between tools that people will actually use and musical practices they're likely to be interested in, things that are fun and simple and not scary, and also things that are maybe pushing at the edges of that stuff a little bit. And this is a tension that's constantly present in our work and we try to solve it with greater or lesser success in, in various ways. Um, we introduced the notion of musical structure by taking YouTube videos of, of tracks and wrapping them in what we call the form explorer. So essentially, we take the timeline of a music video and we bolt onto it chunks that you can click on, and then they play back at that moment, if the web works. <laughs> So you can jump now between various sections. It's a slower internet connection than I was hoping for. So what should be happening here is that you're hearing the next hook and then the third one, if that works. OK, I'm not going to do too many more things that involve buffering. So you can immediately get a sense that there are sections in music, and those sections might be related in some meaningful way. Um, and at the end of all of this work, we introduce a playground which is basically just a space where we put together all of these various sequencers. They play in sync with each other. Again, here we can do some interesting things that are slightly tricky to do in live. So I made a little scaly looking thing. And I can immediately transpose this stuff modally or to new tonal centers. That's actually somewhat tricky to do in live even. But it gives you a chance to hear these sounds that would be quite complicated in, a, in, a, in other music making environments. We build export buttons wherever possible so that what you end up with, if you want, is a valid live set that can immediately open and you get exactly this material in live. So let me move back here for a moment. Um, this is a quote that we got from a teacher. So when we built this stuff, we weren't really thinking about students in classrooms. We were thinking about the, the self-learner. But then we immediately started getting all these emails from teachers in classrooms who were telling us things like this, that it was really exciting for their students. And we were getting lots of emails from people who don't have desktop computers or software in their classrooms because they don't have a budget for it. They have things like Chromebooks. And this stuff one, runs perfectly well on Chromebooks. And this is a really exciting thing for us, that we can bring these music-making paradigms to people without the, we, who would not otherwise have the ability to get something like Live or Max. The browser makes this possible, and I want to hand this over to Jack now to tell you how the browser makes this possible. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to spend the next few minutes discussing uh, the web as a medium for creating educational and artistic experiences. And I think that by discussing some of the affordances, the values, and some of the drawbacks in this medium, it'll give you a better idea of why our stuff looks, feels, and sounds the way that it does. And perhaps I could even inspire you to maybe try to make something in this medium yourself. Um, in 10 minutes, it's really, really hard for me to be um, comprehensive here. So I think the best that I can do is come up with a bunch of conversation starters for the rest of the weekend and after the expo. So if we were talking about oil paint as a medium, I think the natural starting point for us would be to look at a couple of uh, paintings. So let's look at some work that's been done on the web as a medium. So the first thing I want to show you is something which is sort of joyful, playful, absurd. So, the, so this is a work by David Lee, and it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons. It's bringing together lots of interesting technologies like 3D rendering, neural networks, and a lot of joy and fun. As educators, we're particularly interested in works that embody certain principles like sharing. So here's a work by Alexander Chen and Yota Man. Yota Man is actually here at the conference. So this is a really cool site where you can record in your own um, piano performances using a MIDI controller, and then you can also listen to performances that other people have created all over the world. And the performance that someone makes is encoded as a URL, which brings up an interesting point about the web, which is that you cannot overstate the importance of the URL. The URL can point to a particular textual resource, an image, a video, but for us, in the case of like music software, it can also point to perhaps a particular point in a, a composition or a recording that someone made. Um, in the context of the web, sharing is also about sharing process and method. In other words, allowing people to learn from one another. Here's a musical toy made by Jake Alba, or maybe this is not a toy, maybe this is an instrument. So here you can experiment with the idea of musical arpeggiation. And uh, the interesting thing for us about this is that you also see that the, the, entire, oops, the entire implementation of this thing has been laid bare. So if you're interested in understanding how this was made, it's all there. You can just pop the hood on it and take it and do what you wish with it. Uh, one other somewhat interesting aspect of this medium is that it does a pretty good job of bringing together traditional media and um, dynamic media, which allows for a new type of literature, you might say, that really encourages active participatory reading. So this is an introduction to Fourier Transforms that was written by Jez Swanson. And you see how it's blending together like sort of conventional textual explanations with interactive programmatic simulations, audio. This is a interactive that's showing the deconstruction or the composition of a square wave, for example. So this is somehow unique, I think, in some sense to this medium. You, of course, had things like HyperCard in the past but this is what we're working with right now. And as Dennis mentioned, it's also perhaps obvious, but still interesting that the web is anywhere where you have uh, a device that has uh, a web browser on it. The web can also reach out into the real world. So people have made proof of concepts of doing things like controlling DMX lighting rigs or programming uh, MIDI synthesizers by rewriting the sysx on the machine, doing this kind of thing. Uh, so you might have your own characterization of the web, which, depending upon your stance, might be more or less charitable than mine. But here's how I would broadly characterize this medium. I would say that it's inviting, it's ubiquitous, it encourages sharing, it values openness, it's experimental, it's playful, and it works as a technological meeting point. Uh, if you look at this, I would argue that this is, a little, this is quite a bit what Max is like. Uh, and also what's interesting about these values is that they align pretty nicely with the values that you might have as a progressive educator, which is probably another reason why Max has been so successful in educational environments. So there are two interesting values which aren't deeply ingrained in this medium, and those are uh, performance and then also this notion of trust for a developer. So performance has been and always will be a huge bugaboo of audio software development. Um, in 1998, as you can see on the Cycling website, David Ziccarelli wrote, if you are serious about doing audio signal processing on your computer, you want the fastest machine you can buy. That's a PCI-based Mac with a PowerPC G3 upgrade card. That's in 1998. And now the interesting thing about the web is that the performance is largely constrained not by the machine, but by this point about trust for developers. 
and I will explain or attempt to explain what that really means. What this comes down to is the idea of a security model. And the security model for a piece of software like Max is more or less, we think you're a really cool artist. Go make cool stuff. We trust you to act like an adult and we'll give you all the power you need to do interesting things. And we're seeing the result at this conference of giving people that kind of power. Uh, this works well because Max is a relative niche community and you're not going to make millions exploiting Max as an attack vector if you're a nefarious person. The web is a little bit different, which makes things complicated. So the security on the mo model on the web is something like, I assume that you're an advertiser, Bitcoin miner, or a thief, and I must protect my users from you at all costs. And the reason that this is the case is because the web is ubiquitous. So you can actually, it's actually worth your time to um, attempt to exploit people through the web. Now, protection in its most naive implementation, so protecting users from malicious developers, often involves moving the developers like away from the metal, as people might, rec might uh, refer to it. So that means doing things like saying your code cannot run on a high priority thread or we will sandbox your code to put it in a safe environment. And this is directly at odds with the notion of wanting high performance, which in audio we know is really, really important. So in, in one respect this really stinks, but we should also be very, very happy that the people who are stewards of this medium really care about safety because at some, at some level as educators, it's also our job to be responsible for the safety and security of the people that we're attempting to teach. Now for us, when we're evaluating a new medium for our team, we want to avoid a trap which seems very, very common in education. And the trap that I'm, that I'm thinking of here is the thought that because something will be used in an educational environment, it's okay for it to be a bit crappy because it's not really the real thing. We're just learning. And we take issue with that. So on our team, we want to make legitimately musical environments. We do want our experiences to be focused and simple, as you saw on what Dennis, Dennis demoed, but that doesn't mean that they should be unmusical. And I'm not claiming that we've yet achieved this, but this is aspirational. Uh, and it also doesn't necessarily mean that our things need to be super fancy or packed full of all kinds of crazy features. Our, what we want to do is simply make musical experiences which don't feel like toys. So you've all probably experienced this where you have a marimba with three bars and it's not really musical. What we want to give to people is the thing on the right, but then zoom in on it and focus, focus and not have it be intimidating. So I'm interested in talking about this tension between making a toy thing and making something which is really legitimately musical in the context of the web and thinking about it from the side of being technical. And if this is boring to you or it's over your head, don't worry because it's also very boring to me. And sometimes it makes me want to go build a cabin in the woods and just make like wooden guitars. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that in our world, being musical often comes down to things like what's your buffer size? Uh, how much latency is there? What is your runtime? What sort of thread priority do you have? And this sort of thing. Um, so if you'll, if you'll be willing to indulge me in a little bit of technical um, philosophizing. So it's worth asking uh, what must a medium provide in order for people to be able to create legitimately musical music software? And you need to be able to do things like render sample accurate auto, audio, manage audio data, decode and encode audio, uh, be able to schedule events in time, be able to render things to the screen and accept input from various sources like MIDI or multi-touch devices. Uh, Max does a really good job of this because you're given all of these, these tools at your disposal like MSP and Jitter and now Node for Max and this is very, very exciting. So what about the web? Well, the web is a little bit more complicated. Uh, for better or for worse, the development of the web is an international collaborative act. So people decide that they want to have something on the web. They write a specification for that. The specification is scrutinized immensely. Um, and then people go off and they implement that specification. And the hope is that at some point in time, all of these various specifications and technologies will compose nicely into a situation where you have a framework for making interesting music or interesting software. So there's no single handbook. Responsibility and implementation, responsibility for the implementation of all these technologies is actually spread over the entire world in four large organizations, in particular like Google, Mozilla, uh, and Microsoft, and there's no overarching release strategy, which is different than the case where you have someone like David, who's sort of like a benevolent dictator of this really exciting community that you have with Max. So it has its ups and its downs. Um, and for that reason, I'd like to think of the following metaphor when I'm thinking about the web. 
It's a bit like being an explorer and attempting to understand the landscape, which is very, very active geologically. Uh, so on the first day when Seth said that he had a ridiculous history, history vortex, I'm going to show you a ridiculous uh, cartographic metaphor. So this is how I think about the web. So we're all down on the continent here, the audio software mainland, and this is a world of established principles and tools, tools like Max, Live, Super Collider, and technologies like C and C++. In the top left here, there's a, a place which doesn't really exist right now uh, because it's aspirational, and it's this idea of a mythical land of web-based music software where you have something that you can immediately pick up, use, it's musical, it's performant, and joyful. In between, all of these islands are zillions and zillions of technologies which are available to you and are oftentimes very, very um, complicated and hard to understand the relationships between these things. There are also sea monsters out in this uh, landscape. So you have the Scylla and Charybdis of web development down in the bottom left, which are security and performance. You have evergreen problems like browser compatibility. Uh, yeah. And perhaps something that's, that's not obvious but interesting here is that there's a whole generation of software developers who are growing up with this being the normal. So right now, like a lot of people in this room have come to audio programming through something like Max or C Sound or Super Collider. Uh, but there are a lot of people now who this is the medium that they're working in and that this will be their first introduction to audio programming, which is interesting to think about. And it's also interesting to think about the development of this landscape. So if you're the kind of person that might be interested in working in this medium, I think it's interesting to look at what happened in the last 10 years. So if we rewound 10 years ago, the only technologies that you would really have at your disposal are uh, these three down here, HTML, CSS, V8, like I'm being very um, hand wavy about this. Um, and in the last 10 years, you've seen this explosion of technologies which are attempting to turn the web into a framework for making legitimate uh, software. So we're approaching, in some sense, some kind of parity with an environment like the web and something like Max. And I want to focus on two of these technologies specifically, uh, which are the Web Audio API and WebAssembly. So the Web Audio API adds a modular audio graph to the browser and makes it programmable from JavaScript. So that means that you can make something like this in your browser right now. There's an environment waiting for you to, to write code that will generate an audio graph like this. Uh, so let's just show what that actually means quickly. So I don't want you to pay any attention to what's actually going on in this code. I want you to simply think about the slide that was there before and then look at the scale of simply like number of lines or the size of uh, the size of the program here. So in your web browser right now, you can open up develop, developer tools, paste this in, and you're making sound right away. This is of course not a very interesting sound, but it's, uh, it's the case that as soon as you get going, then all of these things compose and, and work together. Um, there are some problems with this approach, and while it's exciting and interesting that this small amount of code can generate uh, a little audio graph, there are also maybe some of the more skeptical in the room, they'll have questions like, okay, well that's great, but who decided what that delay should sound like, and who decided what parameters that delay should have, and uh, where does the code for that delay live, can I actually look at the code, could I bring that delay out of the browser and use it in a different context? And there are all of these questions which aren't well answered by the implementation of um, this UGen implementation, which is in the browser. And this has been characterized for this reason as a uh, one-size-fits-all poorly approach. This is not my characterization, but it's a characterization by the people that have worked on the web audio specification. So luckily, there's a way out of this, so we have kind of a lever to um, escape from this, and there's a way to write your own custom DSP and then put it into um, an audio graph. So let's just take a very quick look at what that looks like. So once again, pay attention to the scale of the code here. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to create a little, uh, a little piece of code which does something very simple, which is just rendering out white noise. 
the point is I have control over every single sample that's being rendered out. So once again, not interesting, but I'd like to think that if Archimedes was a software developer, he might not have said, uh, give me a fulcrum and a large enough lever and I'll move the world. He might have said something like, give me a audio buffer and a callback and I will make music software. <laughs> so the question is, at the moment, is this lever good enough to, to make musical things on the web? And the answer is sort of yes and no for a number of various technical reasons. Um, however, what I would like to say for those of you that are interested in using the web is that the folks who are working on the web audio specification have decided that this is the proper approach to take going forward and they're doing everything that they can to make, um, make it possible for you to write your own code that runs in the browser and break out of the UGen approach which is presented right now. So kind of the final piece of the puzzle that I want to talk about here is what kind of code goes into that callback. Um, so prior to one year ago, the only kind of code that you could write to put in that callback was JavaScript, which made it more or less impossible to do anything that was not trivial in the browser. And as of just last year, you can now do something like take C or C++ plus code, uh, compile it into a format which is readable in the browser using a technology called WebAssembly, and then you're kind of off and running. So we work next to the folks at Cycling in Berlin, and I think that there was sort of a mind meld at the point when these technologies started to become available, and we said, wait a second, you look at this custom DSP block, and you look at what we were previously afforded by the Web Audio API, and if you look up there, that looks an awful lot like something like Gen, or what's available in Max MSP. And the cycling folks are really, really good at doing code generation that generates C++. Like if you've worked with Gen and created a VST, you know that. So what might we be able to actually make if we would do something in Max, use something like Gen to export code and then run it in the browser using WebAssembly? And I think I'm gonna tee it up and leave it there for Chris to talk about some of our uh, preliminary results. Hi. So we have these emerging possibilities for making audio software for the web, and I now get to introduce some of the stuff we're working on right now, which is taking the approach that Dennis described from learning music and using some of these new possibilities to try to get people excited about sound synthesis. So just like on the learning music site, we start off here with a synthesizer that we can get started making some interesting sounds with right away, uh, but without really having to understand how it works. Was that loud enough? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and we progressed from there into breaking down some basic concepts about sound synthesis, introducing them first with a kind of playful interactive graphics that use real world uh, metaphors that might be familiar from uh, just your experience of sound in everyday life. So for instance, we introduce filters for the first time through the metaphor of hearing uh, music coming from the next room. And LFOs get introduced through the metaphor of a merry-go-round with a speaker on it. Hopefully 
coming to an in real life playground near you sometime soon. <laughs> and then progressing from there into other metaphors that might get us closer to what we would normally see on a synthesizer, like what might be uh, the familiar metaphor of a kind of robot helping hand model of modulation. And then eventually getting closer to the more kind of abstract technical representations that you see on most synthesizers. And then from here, we start to introduce more musical context and try to get closer to uh, sound design that starts to feel more like what you might want to actually do with a musician as a synthesizer. And we do that through a series of recipes that start to also introduce bigger uh, blocks of the synthesizer, kind of putting things together. and. Uh, along with introducing musical context, also trying to do that in a way that's going to encourage uh, exploration and tinkering, uh, starting from presets. And I'll show you my favorite of the recipes so far, which is the old-fashioned computer. So as Jack said, we're in a really lucky position in developing software for the web that we get to work with the Cycling 74 people, experimenting with using some of their code generation techniques to make a synthesizer using Max as a development environment. So that's a very kind of zoomed out overview of the synthesizer, that, the synthesizer that's behind the scenes making all the sounds that you just heard in those interactive things. So uh, just giving you the overview here, the purple objects are all the parameters that are connecting parts of the synthesizer to the web app and to the interactive stuff. The green ones are all uh, really the parts the, that make the synth sound the particular way it does. Those are oscillators, envelopes, um, and the filters, which are all gen stuff. And the red boxes are all the things that are currently still broken or um, unfinished or things that I simply don't yet understand how they work. So I don't have to explain to most of you why this is appealing to have an environment like Max to develop in. This is, uh, for us, this is what we, uh, one of the main tools that we use in our musical practices. Uh, at Ableton, it has a lot of specific advantages. Uh, Max has been a part of Ableton's development culture really from the beginning. Uh, the version one of Live came out of ideas that were formed by Robert Henke and, uh, and, and Gerhard Bayliss as Mono Lake developing patches for their own musical practices. Uh, this has continued to be a prototyping and, uh, tool of choice. Uh, a lot of things that end up be, being, um, uh, end up as devices and lives start their lives as max patches and then are progressively engineered by replacing parts of those patches with externals and then eventually becoming C++. Uh, and we also have a bunch of really great synth designers at Ableton who are making Max for Live devices. So. For us, having this environment is a way for us to facilitate collaboration with those people as we're building things like this, and also even to reuse code. In this case, 
we built the synthesizer by uh, stealing bits of uh, poly, which is a, a kind of analog style poly synth that was re-released by Ableton in an updated version last year. We were able to take these nice sounding oscillators, filters, envelopes out of poly and put them together into a synth that was specifically designed for the learning context. And I'll show you what all the parts of the synthesizer look like together in the playground, just like in learning music. Uh, we have at the end everything together, uh, put together in sort of a way that you can play with it in a more open-ended way. Uh, and this also uh, works via web MIDI, so if you plug in a MIDI controller, you can play it that way as well, which is pretty cool. And this will also run on a Chromebook or on your phone or places like that, which is great, especially for learning contexts and to make this accessible for people. Uh, so I'll just, it's a little bit weird to be playing this in front of an audience. You have, I'm gonna try to imagine that I'm kind of like exploring a synthesizer for the first time by myself. <laughs> This is what that might look like. And I'm gonna have to cut myself off there because I could do that for a long time. I think many of you know that feeling and uh, we're excited about sharing that kind of feeling with more people this way. Uh, and I think we're also excited about using some of these same techniques and approaches, not just for these introdu introductory topics, but eventually expanding out into more advanced things, maybe even uh, someday being able to teach max patching on the web. Uh, say without all of the configuration kind of challenges. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to Dennis for the exciting conclusion. So the exciting conclusion is uh, more or less just this, which is well, I should summarize by saying learning music is out. That's a website you can go to right now. The synth thing you just saw is not. It will come soon. We don't want to say when because we'll be wrong and then we'll have overpromised. But it will come out soon. As you can see, it feels sort of close to being done. Um, we're very interested in feedback on all of this work from a technical perspective, from a musical perspective, from a pedagogical perspective. We're a small team and we've made one thing so far, almost two things. So we would love to hear your feedback. You can get in touch with us while we're here or via email. That email goes to the whole team. You can also contact us individually. If you feel like you saw something in this presentation that said, ah, that actually is all I've ever wanted to do with my whole life, I can tell you that Berlin is a lovely place to live and work. Um, <laughs> and we're nice people. So um, that's always something that we're interested in too. Hearing from people like you who care about building communities, who care about music technology, who care about education, and understand what it means to have imposter syndrome, like David talked about at the beginning, what it means to want to do this stuff and not know where to begin. This is what we're trying to do, is take away these barriers so that people can have one great first musical moment, and then they can have another one. Thank you very much.